Hello, Marcus. Hope you can. Hello, Marianne. Good afternoon. Hello, how are you doing? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? <laughs> so, hi, Marcus. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Simone. I think, Marianne, you need to unmute your mic. Oh, I'm sorry. The, 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 hear you correctly. Just a minute. Oh, Simone, I can hear you. There. Now, now we can hear you, Marianne. Okay, thanks. <laughs> nice to see you guys. We're just waiting a little bit for a little bit more people to log in. Yeah. Okay. I think there were 10 people booked to be here today. So let's see how many who remembers to log in. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm sitting in Spain. Where, where are you guys sitting? I'm in France. <coughs> uh, Viera. Mm -hmm. Marcus. So I'm sitting in Switzerland in a small village called Remetville. So it's between <laughs> Baden and Zurich. I don't know whether you know the place a little bit. I don't. I know Zurich, but I, <clears throat> I never heard of the village. But uh, if it's a small village in, Zurich, in Switzerland, I'm sure it's beautiful. It is. It is. <laughs> it's uh, basically my home village. Yeah. So um, I grew up uh, four years and a half here. Yeah. And uh, after traveling around uh, in the world, so um, I came back again with my family to, to my home village now. So Marianne, what is your story? Uh, my story, I'm sitting in French Riviera, which is my, um, my uh, birthplace. I have lived uh, 20 years in Switzerland, so I know very well Switzerland and I yeah. like it very much. I, I used to live in Lugano. Okay, I see. Ah. Very nice place I raised too. my kids there. It was fun and safe and everything. I like Switzerland. It's a good country. It's a, it's a good example for the world. In many aspects, maybe not all of them. <laughs> yeah, nobody's perfect, isn't it? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, they are close to perfection in, so, in, in many aspects. Yeah. And Simone, okay, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear, but uh, let's see, let's see. Simone, what where are you sitting? You tell. I, uh, I am sitting near, uh, near Utrecht in the middle of the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah. so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the far up north then <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> the furthest up north. So, yes, and it's, uh, well, we have good weather today, so it's even uh, a bit warm. Actually, <laughs> but, uh... seeing some, I have a uh, I have a hobby that I am very engaged in, which is car racing. And I saw some people were out racing in the weekend in quite nice weather in uh, in Belgium. Ah. Mm -hmm. ah, oh, that's great! Oh, racing! Yes, I love racing too. Yes, <laughs> I, I I I was brought up in the, in the, on the uh, racetrack in uh, here in the Netherlands. So oh, really, uh, yeah. So that's really I really like that. But well, we have to wait until the. Grand Prix is here, so the Formula One. <laughs> so Marco, Marco Montori, uh, where are you sitting today? Sitting in Italy, northwest, uh, and the very last person that came to the party. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, you know, here we have really that usually pleasant weather, so it's cloudy, windy, it's raining, everything is here, so. <laughs> So the, the typical 
<laughs> typical weather we have in this area in Turin, where I live. Yeah, no, I know that the winter can be a little bit uh, tough up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is aware that Italy has that sun, uh, that uh, so the upper time that you have uh, the afternoon and so on. But here in the north, it's not that always the same, <laughs> the same cliche that we have. So, you know. Cool. You, have, you have the wine and you have the food. <laughs> yes, oh, the wine near Turin is great. I remember a really uh, great Nebbiolo. <laughs> Well, we have to find something. I Meanwhile, it's raining, so <laughs> that's the way we we have achieved uh, to have fun. Meanwhile, it's raining, or well, no, we're not that much, but it's raining, yes. And we have a Berlin friend here from GBO that I know from the time when we were starting the the GBO club in in uh, in Germany, in Berlin. Gary, can you hear us? Not really yet, obviously. Not yet. Let's, let's see if he can get his microphone going. We have Kato here as well, but I don't think Kato has his video on. Can you hear us, Kato? Yeah, I can hear you. And now I have my video on. <laughs> I, was, I was eating. So I thought I, I, uh, I uh, spare you from the side. Yeah? And suddenly uh, a guy with a cool background to the videos. I'm sitting at home today as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's see if we can help Gary here a little bit. Excuse me. And where are you sitting, Kato? Everybody has been telling where they are sitting. And so far, there's not two, two people in the same country. It's quite cool, actually. <laughs> I give I give I, I give you the smart answer. I'm sitting in my office. No, I'm I'm in Cam. You're in Cam. Yeah. Okay. Then. So we are very close. We are. We, we are. are. The French Riviera here today. <laughs> we are close. So, I think we should start. Eh? Five past twelve. Uh, we only have an hour on these videos because everybody have work to do and so on as well. So. So um, thank you for logging in. Uh, my name is Peter Redrin. I've been working as a sales consultant and advisor to a lot of um, uh, company owners uh, around Europe, mainly. A little bit working in Asia and in America as well, but mainly in Europe. I'm from Stockholm, Sweden, originally. And I'm sitting in Mallorca, if I didn't say that. <laughs> so now you know where I am as well. Um, and um, I was asked if I wanted to do this monthly talks about sales and uh, how to increase sales results. And I said, why not? Uh, if you have a skill and you have some experience, maybe you should share it. And I love to share my experiences with my GBO friends for that matter. So, so um, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we've been doing this a few times now and it's become quite... Um, what do you call it? Casual, a little bit casual discussions because I don't know. I've I've been holding a lot of seminars in sales, but I don't think that this is really the forum for that. So I like a debate and a discussion a little bit better. Now we have a new person, Trent. Can you hear us? Trent. We'll hear him sooner or later. There we go. Yes. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hello. We are great. We're just starting the meeting here. So just shortly, tell, tell us where you are sitting today. Uh, I'm in Zurich. You're in Zurich. So we have two people, one in Zurich and one not too far away from Zurich today. Who, who's our other Zuricher? <laughs> I'm. Oh, hello, We know Marcus. each other already. Yes, that's right. I think we met in the bar, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's been, bar. been a long you year. have to repeat it again. Exactly. <laughs> Soon. I was actually on a very, very quick day visit only over the day in Zurich for kind of a week ago. And I was a bit fascinated that the hotel I was staying in, the restaurant was open and people were sitting, eating and drinking wine. And for me, coming from the lockdown in Spain, and I also work in Germany where the lockdown is even worse than in Spain, actually. Um, it was quite amazing to actually sit and have an enjoyable evening <laughs> in a restaurant with a glass of wine and some nice food. That was like, whoa, this was a long time ago. <laughs> Sometimes but, people here just go to the hotel just so they can go out to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, when was this? 
Uh, this was uh, Friday last week, actually. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, cool, cool. No, sorry. So Friday, the week we before. are in the process Friday to the open uh, the, the restaurants inside also again. Mm. So there is a, a lot of pressure on uh, politicians to, um, yeah, to uh, get things going. They cancel the restriction and to open, uh, to, to let open the, the bars and the restaurants again. So cross the fingers that uh, we will come back yeah, hopefully. to the normal. We are all sitting here, I think, in the same boat, hoping that things will go back to normal as soon as possible so we can do our businesses a little bit more as normal again. But um, I, I tell everybody, we, we don't really know when that is. So let's, let's be prepared to fight maybe a little bit harder to make the business we want to do. It's, uh, yeah, sure. As the attack is the best defense, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, Sounds uh, good. <laughs> and at least if you don't have any clients to work with for the moment, at least you have something to do trying to find some new ones. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also good. I think uh, we need to stay busy. If we, if we slow down, I think that's not good for our morale and for our spirit, you know. So we have to keep on pushing forward like always, you know. And, uh, you, you know, in fact, I, I fully agree with you because. Um, my business, I mean, I have a, a company, Swiss, Swiss Mexico Logistics. So I have uh, basically three areas. One is uh, the consulting for opening markets. The second are transport logistics services uh, from to Switzerland, Mexico in particular, but in globally. And uh, the, the um, sales of uh, exclusive Mexican spirits and uh, Mexican red wine, Alpine red wine from uh, 2,300 meters altitude mm -hmm. and uh, bio food uh, products. So I, I fully agree with you. I mean, actually there is nothing you can do. I mean, I can sell my products uh, to private person. I have even also an e-job, obviously I sell them. Uh, my products on, are on, on platforms like brock.ch. But in fact, the, my uh, perspective now is to prepare, um, let's say, the opening of the bars and the restaurants because these are the main clients for me. Mm. And uh, yeah, this is the focus, to be ready once uh, the, the, the stores or the, the, the businesses will open again. This is my focus now. And I, I think actually, in some sense, it doesn't matter COVID or not, good times or bad times, we all, like, always have to sell in two directions. One is short term and one is long term. Sure, I agree. We yeah. always have to work with both those parameters, you know, and for the moment, many are stuck in the little bit more long term, like you're saying, you know, it's not going to be money today, but if I do a good job now, I'm going to get the fruits from my work maybe in a few months time. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important to, to do that work because I see a little bit too many people slightly panicking, just trying to grab some straws here and there to get in quickly a new client in. And that's normally not the way to run, to, to build a, a stable business, you know, a stable client, client in, in intake, you know, with, with a little bit of a queue even. That would be nice, wouldn't it, <laughs> if we had a queue? <laughs> So, so and, and if you're going to create that, you have to work both with short and long term sales all the time, all the time. You have to maybe choose what percentage of your time and money and effort you choose to put on short or long term. But only looking for quick business is not good and only working long term is not good either. So we have to mix. We have to. Yeah, mix. I fully agree. Marianne, what would you say that you have on your mind today when it comes to sales? Are you just a little bit open-minded to listen or do you come with a topic that you'd like to debate? Um, I'm open-minded to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have always something to, to learn. And I was writing down what you just said, actually. Uh, this uh, division uh, between uh, short-term sales and mm -hmm. Uh, long-term sales mm. very interesting mm. and I, I was related to this uh, to to my business to my own business and thinking okay what do I do as short term okay this I can answer very well and as long term I, I guess I, I put a lot of efforts of branding mm. so it builds the, 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 the desire 
into customers' minds. Mm. This is what I can, I can tell about my business now. Mm. But uh, uh, it opens my mind to, uh, to think uh, of more things about long terms. It's very interesting. Mm. Oh, may I add that uh, <clears throat> my business has, has not been uh, suffering from COVID at all. Mm -hmm. So it's all the contrary. We are completely overwhelmed with the orders and wow. not able to produce everything. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm just, uh, you know. Maybe you can uh, send some lines to all of us as well. <laughs> this conversation is very, uh, very useful anyway for the long term, for the future, for everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Cool. Simone, uh, do you come with a topic or are you just listening in? Well, no, not, not just listening in. Um, my, my topic, I think, is more um, how uh, I am an organizational developer, uh, developer and I, uh, luckily my business is also not suffering anymore <laughs> from the COVID uh, um, um, crisis. Uh, so that's, that's also, I'm very, I'm feeling, feeling very lucky with that. Uh, but I'm now also uh, diving into how I can can start the, the, the long-term um, uh, way of, of lead generation. So how mm. can and how can I use the social medias for that mm. uh, to really get a kind of, of wheel in motion that will just keep turning whatever mm. happens in the world, mm. but that I can just also um, connect with people who may be interested in my, my uh, my services or uh, guidance somewhere uh, down the line, uh, down the road, I should say. So that, that's more, yes, and I'm, well, I'm mm. curious about other topics um, and uh, sales is really something that interests yeah. me. It's interesting, uh, lead generation, because lead generation is something I always been working a lot with and helping loads of clients with during all my years mm -hmm. sales to how can we create the perfect lead generation? Mm -hmm. Perfect lead yes. flow. And actually, yeah, so, what, is, what is the perfect lead flow? That's an uh -huh. even interesting question. Yeah. You know, because What's the perfect lead, right? That, that, that's yeah. where it all starts. <laughs> Who do I want to connect with? Yes. Another thing that I, that I always try to talk to people about is that maybe you should choose your clients very carefully who you start working with because you have to live with them. True. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and, and, and for, my, for my business, I, I have to, to live and work with them for a long time. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it, it, it's better that we have a good uh, click <laughs> also on personal level. And that makes it um, uh, a different kind of, of, of connecting with people. Yeah. Uh, I can't just do a kind of hit and run and sell my products and then go and hopefully they will return. Mm. I really have to establish a, a really relationship and a mm. trust and everything. And, uh, yeah. No, and, so and it's different uh, in that respect. Yeah, depending on business area, many times it's actually equally much work to take care of, small, of a small client like as taking care of a bigger client. Mm. Which is also a little bit the reason why I always tell people try to try to try to look in the future and what kind of clients would you like to be working with in two years time you know can you describe that client database you know what, what kind of clients should it be what yeah. how, how would they look like what are you doing with them how much money do they spend per year yeah. on you and yeah. maybe you have to start finding those kind of clients that you really want to have in the future otherwise we might get stuck with the clients we just get stuck with without thinking yeah. much, and then we are <laughs> yeah the 100 small clients that uh, that you have to run like hell to make service to and you make x amount of money per year and then you could actually have built up if you thought to be differently maybe a clientele of 30 clients that are ordering five times more from you with half the work you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think um, short term long term is always something to think about and also what kind of client am i do i actually want to work with in the future so we don't have the notes have to be a little bit longer, you know. <laughs> we have to think <laughs> a little bit yes. further ahead. You know? And when it comes to lead generation, I think if you can mount up an automated lead generation process that gives you exactly the clients you want to have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's an interesting topic. I think that's always an interesting topic. Yes, Marco. Marco, do you come with a, some topic you like to discuss, or are you just listening in? 
Honestly, I was just listening. I mean, I've uh, I've submitted my <laughs> my subscription last Thursday. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm looking around, but I think that I've already been in a couple of other meetings, and I've been it's been very interesting because there are people. I mean, I, I was looking for s- certain people, and I think that I found them. And uh, maybe I would say that uh, there is there is something that has, has emerged even on the other meeting, the other two meetings I've been in, that we, we have to be ready for the moment the market is going to open again. But it seems to me that there are a few things that maybe on the situation I'm living here is not that we're not that aware, but about the mechanics on how the, how the client are going to behave after all this crisis that we have around. And I, I give you an example because uh, we, uh, we had a staff meeting uh, last month of, to try to understand what we were willing to do for the 2021. And I am into the cosmetics. And uh, we have said, okay, would we go for the epigenetic or would we go for the snail's mucine? But at the end, we have come up with all the statistics related to how the, even all the channels that sell products have become during the 2020. And the 2020 has said that probably all the, all the shops are going to be closed for a long while. So where do we put all this product? And then we said, okay, let's let's turn to Amazon or some other more vertical uh, web tools to sell the products. And then, then we have to build up all the lead generation process and so on. And then we have said, okay, but 2021, 2020, in 22, 2022, how is it going to be? And then we have come up even because we look at the mechanics for many other clients because we are coaching here, it's come up that we said, okay, but after this crisis, the, the market is not going to open up immediately, even if all the shops are going to be opened, but the people are not going to be there because they're, maybe they are too scared or maybe they are not too believing that it's really over. And then what are we going to do? And so maybe it's, it's, uh, it, it is important to have a look at the, not only at the statistics on how the market has evolved during these two years or three years that it are going to be, but also look into the mechanics of the people and to try to understand how this crisis is going to last in the future, because probably what we have thought until yesterday is not going to occur even tomorrow. And then uh, one of the things that I was trying to think, uh, because for this cos- cosmetics is, is a mess uh, today, uh, we are trying to understand which other client we want to tackle and uh, which for producing and which are the, the, the channels we have to tackle to put the products in there and all the, the related activities. I mean, we have talked about here the social media. Social media, we say, okay, let's take a social media manager and it is going to lead every day thousands and tons of leads or messages to collect people. How is the message we are going to give them? Because we have to try to re-emulate the, what we call in Italy, passaparola. I say a good thing to that product, to my friend is going to buy it and passing the words between the people. Word word of mouth. And and then with that, we we have to think probably today to all this, nothing is going to be that mechanic because the the mind of the people have changed. And then uh, this is something probably that we have to think about altogether because we have to try to understand how is the the mind of the people or how it has evolved during the time. Mm -hmm. And it does not just say, okay, till yesterday we did like this and then we have to go on like this because probably it's going to open. We have to rethink several things. And uh, that's the big big challenge. And probably the things I'm going to 
they're not returning the same even in five years because probably all the new channels that we have created today are going to be the channel that are going to lead the market tomorrow. We can complain this Amazon that is going to take everything, but probably Amazon is the, the only one that is going to, to sell all the product in the future because it's everywhere. That's, that's the point I'm, I'm thinking of to try to understand what to do in, uh, in the, next, the next month. And, and <coughs> the short term is to, what can I do today to be ready on the moment we are all thinking that probably from September, the market is going to open in any case, or we are going to have probably 100 million people on the, on the street without any, without any, any job. Marco, I think it's very interesting things you're saying. Shall we give the word over to Kato since we only have one hour for everybody to talk a little bit? Oh, oh yeah, I've lost, I've lost your voice at a certain point. No, I said, can we give the word over to Kato now? Because everybody has to have a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I took too long. But, <laughs> but I'm, I'm like this. Stuff. It's very interesting stuff you're talking about. And I think this is stuff that we all are thinking about. Kato, what, uh, what do you come with to the meeting today? Our ears. All ears. All ears. <laughs> I, I want to listen. It's, um, uh, you know, we're in the pandemic and, uh, and we're two choices. It's either crisis management or be creative. And one thing I am 100% sure of is that we are not going back to the old normal. That's not going to happen. So, so, so it's just forget about that. Mm. Um, high streets are closing, distribution channels are collapsing, etc., etc. So, so we're not going to go back to the new normal. That's where I'm coming from, and uh, and I'm here to to get as many ideas for myself as possible, so I uh, can apply my own uh, critical thinking of what what is to me. But one thing I'd like to say is that we have always have a tendency to view. Um, the future from the memory of the past. And I don't think that is going to work that well now. You know, having the same thoughts create the same emotions that gives the same experience that ends up in the same behavior. Right? If See what happened after the crisis in financial, or the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and so on. The world never came back to the same. Look at the financial market. We're printing money, hands over fist, and fist over hands, or whatever. And uh, and uh, we are in the second or third dip in recession. The stock markets go up like a rocket. So 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 there's something else going to come out of that, come out of this one. I don't know which. So I'd like to hear your guys' ideas about how we go about sales in these times. Yeah. Because old thoughts won't work. No, that's correct. Trent, what is your take on all this? Uh, just one insight from when Marco was talking was just thinking about maybe two different types of uh, consumers and you know, consumers like me who don't enjoy shopping. Again, it's not one of my hobbies. It's not something that like, relaxes me. So you know, I've kind of always had a slight preference for online shopping. Obviously, some things you can't do that. But like, I don't really see myself going back as soon as shops open and like going and, and shopping. That like I've probably switched over to being a, even more of an online shopper semi permanently. Um, but that you know that also I think that there might be some ways to decide marketing strategy based on if you think that your typical consumer of your product is a shopper or not, or or prefers the online shopping. Uh, that, you know, that, that this basically pandemic has probably solidified that behavior, that the ones who enjoy shopping, it's something that, you know, it's not a task for them. It's something part of the you know, relaxation almost type of thing, retail therapy, as they say in the U.S. That, you know, those are the ones that, oh, they're going to be flooding back in the stores and, and wanting all of that. And then, you know, the people like me, they're like, nope, I'm, I'm online now. I mean, for me, I was actually, it actually took me two weeks to realize this, the stores were closed here during the recent, most recent lockdown because I don't go to the mall to do the grocery shopping. So it's just, you know, I went to the single grocery store, came out two weeks later, I'm like, oh, wait, really? how long have stores been closed? Um, so that was just, you know, one 
you know, kind of insight that came up while, while Marco was talking in terms of what looking to get from this. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like in some ways the, uh, the talk, you know, the, the, the new normal that isn't going to be anything normal that will be continually shifting, maybe valid validates my strategy of diversifying uh, and trying to just be as flexible as possible to respond um, because not knowing what uh, what the economy is going to look like three months from now, um, you know, makes it pretty difficult to plan a strategy. Um, but uh, we shall see if uh, if things do uh, stabilize and we're uh, still out there with you know in a million uh, different directions, then uh, this particular strategy might look like it was flawed that uh, that we should have been narrowed down and really focused on one particular. So that's kind of what's on my mind today. Cool, Alex. Thank you for being here. Hi guys, sorry for, to be late. The, um, we, we are in the B2B uh, devices. Uh, basically, we, we reinvented walkie-talkie and radios. Uh, usually walkie-talkie is a short technology, short range. We do something global and satellite-based. Uh, just in short, I don't want to bother you about techie. Um, the, I am basically a big fan of, I'm a Red Cross volunteer in the same time. So I, I see the pain, I see the, the death and so on. Uh, but in the same time, I love, uh, I'm a fan of, sorry, of COVID because, uh, especially because I'm Italian ori origin, uh, you know, uh, we are less innovative and we see everything now on the same page globally. So doing a video call on the same city like Milan is, is normal today. Based on that, uh, what, what we are looking for is, uh, there is B2B usually is a contact Build business, so agents, sales guys, and key account manager. And what we are looking, what we we, we bet, uh, looking at the COVID uh, transformation or shifting as before, let's say before, is just in, in our view is just ten ahead. It's like our future, uh, re return to the future, back to the future <laughs> movie. So you, it just is ten years ahead, and thinking how it would be ten years ahead in in a short in a short months, just in a couple of months in 2020. And the, the bet is, could B2B selling, again, it's based on physical re re relationship, shift to uh, the web, to digital uh, transformation? Uh, general question is yes. Uh, point is how much? This is our point. Cool. Then we have a few topics. Uh, and um, if we, I would like to say something because uh, I mean, I, I'm in the business of helping company owners who likes to have to find the perfect sales process. And I've been working with around 300 companies in my career so far to, to help them do that. And um, a few things strikes me very similar. It doesn't matter what you really do, if it's business to business or if, if it's a consumer. Um, there's two parameters I think you should try to focus on and even spend some money and time, not only time on, but also a little bit money on. Um, I see many times there's a lot of companies who, like company owners, who don't spend money on creating a good sales process. They spend a lot of time on it, but not money. And in today's world, there's one thing I particularly like people to spend money on rather than time, and that's lead generation. Uh, there are so many good ways today to create automated lead generation uh, setups. Either it's business to consumer over Facebook or, or, or Google AdWords or whatever automated process you can do for B2B. LinkedIn has fantastic opportunities today that many people don't know about <clears throat> so much to create uh, incoming leads from the managers of companies in business to business processes. So I think you have a budget and spend some time and money on finding the perfect mix for your lead generation solves a lot of other things that we otherwise spend time and money on to, to try to fix. And I was like saying like, yeah, uh, I have pain in my back. Maybe I should go to somebody who massage my back, right? That's quite an easy thing to think about. Or maybe you should actually go to a chiropractor and try to figure out why I have pain in my back. And then you go to the chiropractor and he says, yeah, because you have 
leg muscles because you fit too much, that's why you hurt too much. And that's a little bit how I see that people do with sales sometimes. They do, instead of solving the problem, yeah, for sure, for sure. instead of solving the problem, they do a painkiller, you know? And uh, the, the good lead generation process, suddenly the question of sales team, resellers and things like that becomes much more easy to solve. If you own your own lead flow for your own sales effort or for people you employ or people you contract or resellers or whatever, if you're the one owning the lead flow and know how to get the good leads, then you're the king and you will always have good business. And I think more now than before, it's also important to, to contact more volume of people in different potential business client segments than before. Uh, because of the pandemic, we have lower hit rates, so to speak. So if we previously talked to, if we contacted with some kind of a leads machinery, 100 people per day who were in our target group, maybe we got five answers or 10. Now, maybe we get one or two for the same effort. So, but the interesting thing I think with lead generation processes is that if you can figure out the perfect mix of lead gen automated lead generation uh, processes that gives you the right amount of good hot leads, then you can achieve something which I always tell people to try to achieve in sales. I'm, I'm saying what a wonderful world it would be if all day long people working with sales, the only thing they do is to talk to people who already told them that they are interested to buy something. That would be quite, that would be quite nice, wouldn't it? I mean, Definitely. in some really bad cases I get involved in sometimes, I see maybe one or 10 or 100 people and they are sitting still today. They're cold calling, you know, trying to cold call to get a client. I'm saying, yes. Christ, that's the most slow and inefficient and expensive process you can do. Stop doing that. Spend 1,000 euros on the right process per month or per week or doesn't matter. I mean, depending on how many leads you need for to, to fill up your budget. But find that flow and then maybe two people can do what 10 people did before when it comes to sales volume. So... For me, it always starts with creating the correct leads flow. It doesn't matter what business it is. Some businesses are more easy to think about leads flow. Like if, if you own a real estate company, what do you do? Well, you put up cool properties you have for sale on the property platforms, you know, and then you have people who send you a text. Oh, I like that property. Can you call me? And, but then they are more maybe obscure. Let's say you're an IT consultant company and you want to speak to IT managers who want who are exactly now in the process of thinking of buying this kind of system, which is much more tricky, of course, <laughs> than getting somebody to say, hey, that's a nice apartment. Can you call me? I want to know more about it. So different companies, depending on what they are doing, must use different kind of lead flow mechanics, of course. But I think that I always recommend the first thing you do, decide what clients you want, make sure you find them by incoming leads from a leads and automated lead generation process that keeps giving you new leads every day automatically. And yes, you have to spend some money on it, but in the other end of the sales process, you save so much time and money by easy, easily sell more and have a bigger profit margin. So, um, so that's one thing I always try to tell people. And another thing I try to tell people as well is that split up the sales process, you know? I see in worst case scenario, one person is doing the whole process. They're cold calling and then they find somebody who wants to listen to them and then they have a meeting, video or not. And then they are the person who is trying to get the quote out to the client and then the person starts to close them and then wow, somebody suddenly buys something, so they become a new, new client in the client register and we invoice them some money. And then that same person is supposed to follow up that client for the next coming 10, 20 years and make sure they buy more from you. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense that the same person is going to do all that, is it? So we have to, depending on how, what we are selling and what we are doing, we need to segment, put segments into the sales process and say, how do we do this part of the sales 
process in the most smart, efficient, perfect way. And then this part, and then this part, and then this part, and then this part. And many of the people have been helping to, to put the sales process in, 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 in kind of steps and, and, and they realize quickly, you realize the same person should have done every, all of this. Who can be fantastically good at talking to new clients on the phone? And in the same time, be very good at closing big deals. And in the same time, being the long-term relationship person to make sure that these people buy and buy again and more. You know, it, it doesn't make sense that the same person is going to do the whole process. So the second you let go of that thought and you start to put this process in maybe the three, four, five, six steps it has actually, then you find a really good rhythm and flow in the company when it comes to how you, you sell. Because <clears throat> sometimes I see that people are so focused on trying to find new clients that they forget how much business we can do with the existing clients. That's a very, very easy mistake to do. Very, very easy. I can tell it you about it. It's very easy to, to make a correction on this. This is an easy one. Yeah, that, that's an easy one. But, but on the other hand, you need to have resources for all this. And many people are actually kind of understaffed with their sales process. They don't have time for all of these things. And then what happens is that you, you just take care of the low hanging fruits and then the rest doesn't get done. I can give you two examples. For three years, I was helping PricewaterhouseCoopers to become good at upselling their existing clients. And they got interested in doing that because we made a survey and it turned out that a uh, standard PricewaterhouseCoopers client uh, knew about the, 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 the of course, the, the basic uh, um, accountant service. And apart from the accountant service, they knew about 0 0.8 of the other services <laughs> when asked, how many, what kind of services can you buy from PricewaterhouseCoopers? And, and this was to, to clients that's been clients of PricewaterhouseCoopers for more than five years or more. <laughs> Which means you, here you have a company with 14 service areas. And the biggest one is, of course, accounting for small, small and medium-sized businesses. And uh, they need their accountant at least once a month, or maybe two. And this accountant never informs the clients of what else they can buy from PricewaterhouseCoopers because it's not their job, because they're accountants. So they don't care if they sell any more services, right? Because they just focus on being a good accountant. So that project was three years to make sure that every person working in the whole company actually started to bit by bit actually present to their clients when they spend time with the clients about all the services they had, which was an incredible increase of sales in built in that process. Another case is uh, I worked for four years with a company called uh, uh, SunGuard. Um, disaster recovery company, quite big American, uh, private owned uh, disaster recovery IT service company. And, um, and they had, uh, at that point, I was working only with the Swedish office and uh, they had eight uh, key account like people, quite senior salespeople, because they were working with big clients, you know, 24 hours, IT stuff, you know, and all these disaster recovery servers and quite big expensive stuff, and especially for the clients like banks and stuff like that, that needed that by, by law, they had to have the, these kind of things. And, and um, we took out their database from their CRM system. And it turned out that out of their 1,300 clients in Sweden, they had spoken the last year to 82 of them. In their, long, in, in their long history you know, of building up these clients. And then we started to talk to the salespeople. Why, why don't you talk to the, well, they never called us. They bought this and they're happy. <laughs> and it was like, okay, maybe we should try to call everybody and see if they'd like to have a meeting about maybe something new. And they said, we don't have time for that. <laughs> right, okay, here we have a problem. So what we did was that we employed uh, a girl who was very, very good uh, from the call center industry. And she had been working in call centers selling IT services. And we put her to call all these clients that nobody called for a year or more. And 
frankly, just being nice and friendly and asking if they would like to have a meeting with one of the experts from SunGuard Availability Systems and just see if we can find something that maybe we can help them with. And that became a process that, in my mind, they are still working with that girl, actually. And this is many years ago we, we employed her in that company. And uh, this became an incredible increase of, of orders from, from their existing client stock. And then after a while, I said, why don't we make a LinkedIn campaign to all IT managers in Sweden and ask them if they would like to have a meeting with SunGuard Availability Systems. And then we started to put that in her daily work as well. So we have one percentage calling every three months existing clients. And we had suddenly an influx also of a couple of leads per day from people who answered over LinkedIn that they would like to meet SunGuard and see what they can do for them. And this girl was pretty busy, I tell you. And I can tell you that those half lazy key account managers were suddenly very, very busy with meetings and stuff, you know. So sometimes maybe you shouldn't tell people, call more calls, go to more meetings. Maybe you should just book them for them. You know? <laughs> and that was a huge success factor for, for that process. You know? And in all these kind of company cases I've been working with, I discovered that many times they only, they only communicate with a little fraction of their potential market. LinkedIn is quite interesting when you, when you go into the ad module. I don't know how many of you have been working with LinkedIn ads. But if you go into LinkedIn ads and create, just create any ad, and then you can start to make some quite, quite interesting stuff in there. Because when you're in the ad module, you can put like, okay, my market is Germany, for instance. And then you put in, my clients are these kind of managers, do, 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 do save and then boom in the right hand corner comes a number how many of those is there on linkedin in germany <laughs> and normally it's a much higher number than you think <laughs> and then we say okay how many of our potential clients who obviously are here on linkedin as well how many of them did we speak to last year in total and then maybe somebody say well we spoke to 120 Okay, but here it says that it's 12,400 <laughs> in Germany. So in effect, in one whole year, you penetrated 1% of the market, of your potential new client market. You even try to say hello to them. And that's where automated lead generation comes in because it can be very, very expensive to have a lot of staff employed to do all these <laughs> cold calls, you know. And then, of course, it's better maybe to spend... I don't know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. My company are helping both ourselves and many of our clients. We spend around 40,000 euros on LinkedIn campaigns every year, creating leads. And um, um, very quickly, you can find a way to um, suddenly talk to all these people, Maybe at least send them a text over, a personal sponsored text over LinkedIn twice a year. Maybe not a bad idea. So um, I think those two things are the two things we work the most with. When, when I'm out and a few, I have a few consultants working with me and when we are out, we, we see that there's a big lack of lead generation processes automated and there's a big lack of thought how to segment the process so we have the right person is doing the right job, so to speak. If you're a one-man person, you're a bit stuck with yourself, of course. <laughs> that's, of course, can be a little bit of an issue, but maybe that means that you should actually consider. When I started as a one-man consultant for many, many years ago, this is 1997, I decided to become a sales consultant instead of being a sales manager. And I started my own little consultant company. I rented an office, big enough for two because I wanted a bit of space. And very quickly, I realized my best investment after renting the office was to employ an assistant, which I did very quickly because I was a consultant. I wanted to be out consulting, right? That's when I make money. I don't make money if I'm not consulting. <clears throat> it's almost like being a doctor, you know, when you're a consultant. <laughs> Either you should be meeting a client for, for, for selling something or you should deliver consultant service. You shouldn't spend time with anything else, right? 
And of course I couldn't do that myself, but with the assistant, I could. So she made sure that anytime I didn't have booked with consultancy, I was fully booked with sales meetings. Um, and that was a quite interesting journey from, I think I was in the beginning, maybe invoicing four or 5,000 euros per month. And with an assistance help, I was up to 15,000 a month after two months work only. So um, yeah, this is a little bit thoughts of mine, you know, which I haven't said so much about online marketing and for online shopping and things. And maybe that's the reason for that because I don't work so much with B2C. I work mainly with B2B. So that's why my, most of my, my thoughts are in the, in the B2B segment. But if we stop here and, and just go a quick round, what, what do you think about the things I've been saying now? And we start with Marcus who's, who started from the beginning. Uh, I, I fully agree with um, the lead process generation. I fully agree uh, what you have told with the segmentation of the sales process. Myself in the past, I was sales manager for Kino Nail. I built up a sales office in Mexico uh, and then I was responsible for a joint venture in Mexican, Swiss, uh, uh, German um, for four years. So yeah, this is, I, I fully agree. I would also uh, mention what um, is it still there, Marco said. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is also now, um, due to the new situation, the completely changed environment dynamics, which uh, are created now uh, for the COVID pandemic, whatever, which definitely will not be the same world as in the past. I think there is also um, two things. The need of the clients. I think there it's very important to segment the layers of the client. What is really their need? I mean, there are very cost-driven people. Uh, uh, now there are people, they focus on efficiency. There are people, they focus on novelty. Um, so I think it's very important to, to really think about um, the, the basic need the client will have for your business. And the other thing I think is the emotional effect. Um, I mean, I've been living with my family 10 years in Mexico and in Mexico, there is one thing uh, which is very crucial. If you are in the consumer goods business, so like food and, and uh, uh, beverages, um, the providers, they bring you the stuff, okay? They, they come to you. So um, you don't have to go to a restaurant you have it in front of your door, basically. And um, I think this is also a thing we, we will have to think about because I think this uh, fixed location based business, yeah, will work perhaps for half of the companies actually uh, in, uh, but I think the others will have to change completely their business model. I think we have to go more uh, uh, mobile, more to the consumer uh, because also of the restrictions. I mean, you see with, with uh, uh, restrictions that uh, in Germany, in some areas, you can go 15 kilometers away from your house. So you are limited. You, you are not be able anymore to, to travel and, and to have a quick journey somewhere else. Um, yeah, and the last thing I, I think is um, that collaboration will be much more important what you said, uh, because um, due to these restrictions, um, I have seen it also, if you want to send, let's say a parcel with, with uh, samples, from Switzerland to Germany or to Austria, you're already stuck because you cannot cross over uh, the, 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 the front, uh, the, the border again, because you need a negative COVID uh, test. So 
And uh, now the, the, the Austrian uh, government, they told, hey, we, we do not even uh, accept Swiss negative COVID test. You have to do it in Austria. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think you will have, you, you will need partners locally, mm -hmm. which uh, you can collaborate and rely on. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, these are my my uh, inputs and thoughts. Marianne, yeah. what 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 are your comments to this? For uh, all what we've been talking about, my business is a business to consumer. So mm. I I try to relate some parts of what you said, and I thought it was very interesting, and uh, yeah very interesting for me mm. and uh, I feel maybe I'm, I'm completely out but I feel like I'm already ahead mm. um, even if my company is very small and my business is small but uh, first of all it's a niche business and uh, we, we already know who are our clients and uh, we, we started as, a, as, a, as an online business and as an, uh, a global business, so and as a B two C, so mm -hmm. we already are in this uh, thing about social media marketing, mm -hmm. um, uh, targeting the clients uh, on a very narrow um, uh, lane thing mm -hmm. uh, way. I don't know, and also um, this is why we we did not suffer from from the crisis, the COVID crisis, I guess, because. Uh, um, we are already set up for the for the next thing now. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to add. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, fine, no problem, no problem. I'm happy that you found it. I, I think very very interesting what, what you said, and also uh, I took a lot of notes <laughs> because <laughs> you know this business to business is not my field, so I thought it was really interesting interesting yes and uh, well what I find very interesting and very useful is uh, the, the part you said about uh, reactivating the, the old clients because I have this too I have a part of um, uh, new clients and a part of uh, returning clients but what I never measured really is who are my clients who did not order since uh, six months or maybe last year and uh, this I thought very interesting. So I have to maybe to, to translate what you say to my mm. own uh, business, to my own model mm. and uh, work on this. Thank yeah. you so much for the very good idea. Yeah. I think it's important with all these things, if you put it down on a paper, everything you should do in sales and how does the clients look like and everything, there is actually a process to build with all these things. You, know, you can have a, how do I reactivate old client process and there are actually companies doing this very very smart and very personalized on email base or something like that you know so you, yeah. also, again, you can use automated functions to to keep track you know sometimes we are client with with some company and suddenly says hi peter it's john here how are you doing listen here on the link here you know i was thinking about you and blah 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 you know you know it's about the automated email but it's yeah, a bit it's funny and it's a bit nice and it's quite easy to click on that button and see what, off, what the offer is, you know, because you've been buying from this company before or whatever, you know, if they've been buying before, they have some oh, really? brand, brand memory of you, you know, and then, then it's easier to communicate in a very personal it's way. Sure. It is, and we can brand those, those emails uh, in a very nice way. Yeah. Uh, of course, they know it's automated, yeah. but if it's, uh, if it's branded the right way, it's always well accepted. I, I can see it with the other actions that, that, that we do. So Correct. Thank you very much. Cool, Mariana. Simone? Oh, your microphone is off. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I can uh, certainly agree with uh, with uh, with Mariana to say it is very interesting to hear you talk about uh, the sales process and how um, uh, some of the um, uh, some of the things that you can consider. And um, I'm obviously in a different kind of business as Mariana is. I'm business to business and mm -hmm. all by myself. 
Mm. So when you were talking about splitting up the process in roles, I was thinking, okay, well, I have to divide myself. <laughs> and uh, and I, but I do know what kind of role I, I like to play in the process. So that really helps me to see what, what do I need to, um, to set up because I'm really the relationship builder. Mm. Uh, but also the e easy making in the first contact so that that's but in between the really sales closing etc deals closing uh, well that, that's something that uh, that I'm doing but uh, still um, need to prog when progress on that yourself, when you're by yourself in the company this with automation of different processes is getting mm -hmm. more important because yes. otherwise yes. you may never do it you know and if it's that's true. It's happening a little bit every day because you pay a little bit to make something happen, then suddenly it, things start to fall into your lap without you having to work so hard with it. That's true. So, and that's that's why I'm now um, uh, considering my options and setting that up, mm -hmm. and having also the automation in process with a database and and and, and uh, automated messages and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really not uh, well to get that confirmed that that is really going to help me. Get mm -hmm. more sales landing in my in my lap. Well, <laughs> great. Yeah. So that's that really uh, strengthens me in my belief that I really have to focus on that for the moment now to really set that up in the right way. Okay. So thank you for that. Cool, Simone, Marco. Yes. Now you're back. Oh, I would say I I'm gonna be quick. Um, I think that is just one thing maybe we have to put in the plate, maybe for another occasion. You, you said wonderful things because it's, it's, it's what we have to follow. But what I would say is that you are maybe like most of us, a one-man show where you have to do every day, we have to invent your day every day to go on with some other business and so on. And then with that means that we have to perfectly know the, 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 the product we are selling for ourselves. And when, on the case we're coaching or we are doing some consultancies, we have to tell the clients the kind of product they have and the way they have to behave in front of the, them clients. And probably seems seems obvious, but it's not that obvious that we have in front of us most, most of the time companies that are not that aware of the, the product they have. And on the case, we have a small company like, uh, um, oh gosh, I forgot the name, Marianne, it's they know the product, but uh, we, may have be in, we may be in front of some other companies there and where the bigger it is, uh, the, 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 the comprehension of the product is less, less, lower and lower. Oh gosh. You hear me? It just left then. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There was somebody banging on my door and I had to check what it was. Sorry. It was, uh, it was no the way. gardeners who wanted something. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I, I repeat the, the last sentence. I mean, on the case uh, then, we, we have to tell the client where how the product is. And most of the times we know that this, is, this thing is easier when we have a, a smaller company, but when the company is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, this process is going to be completely removed because we have people that know that, well, I'm an account, uh, I am project manager, I am a disaster project manager recovery, blah, 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 blah. And then with that, maybe we also have this kind of thing that we have to have, to, we need to have in mind, knowing better the product and, and get into it to propose it to, to the others. And it is not something, it seems something very obvious, but it is not, especially for the company over the 50 people. We have people that are um, hired to be there doing that thing, writing emails every single day, but all the rest is off. They don't know what, what else is going to happen. And this is something that this mechanics is, has to be removed because today this new mechanics, this new trend uh, for the COVID probably is going to say, okay, this is the occasion for the natural selection. The one that wants to go on and the one that has to be out of this process because this planning, extreme planning economy is not going to be there any longer in the future. 
I don't know if I've, I've been. <laughs> I'd be I love playing. to listen to you, Marco. It, it is everything you say is is so correct. It's just that sometimes it's difficult to have the exact answers. What what are we going to do with that? I think we have to wait and see a little bit. Um, I think it's difficult to predict the future for the moment. Kato, what do you think? Um, I I have a lot of thoughts right now, and um, number one. What I think is that, or what needs to be considered, because I wouldn't say I think this will be the case, but what needs to be considered is that all the sales activities, as we know it from the past, yeah, mm -hmm. have been based on generating revenue. And most salespeople are measured on generating revenue. Revenue is a vanity. Profit is sanity. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that revenue which is negative to start with. So that is number one. Number two is that sales function is not an isolated function going forward. And neither is finance or marketing or production or whatever. The whole company in a digital world is going to be much more integrated. So it's no longer going to be a function in competition with another function because that is destructive. Uh, so I, I think that will change. And when that is changing, what, what I think may happen, yeah, is the greed culture we go out, yeah, that it's all about making money to the owners. I don't think that will prevail. I think the business in the future will be much more inclusive, much more equal, etc. And when that is the case, there will be much more focus on the top line as opposed to the bottom line. Because when you do the right things on the top line, yeah, the bottom line will follow. And I think that's going to, and we're going to see that more and more. Actually, Apple did that. When Steve uh, Jobs came back, he focused on the top line. He said, forget about the bottom line. And I say no more about that thing. Yeah, I think that, that proves itself. Hmm. And, and, and when that's happening, what we're going to see, because we live in a digital world where things are much more integrated, building your business based on a business architecture, which is inside your own walls, is not longer going to be sustainable. It has to be built for an ecosystem, which is outside, which takes your customer, partners, regulator, etc., into account into your business uh, architecture or, or, or the whole uh, economy architecture. And then you will start to build business models per product, not an industry-based business model, which is outside in. You will build a business model on an inside out basis. And you may have a different business model for one product as opposed to another one, but the whole operation, including sales, et cetera, et cetera, needs to hang together in a totally, totally different way. So, Come back to your lead generation. I don't disagree, but I don't agree either. Because everyone, every person whose name on a lead generation is being measured by something. Generally, the salesperson has a measure that is created at the beginning of the fiscal year. But as things changes, business changes are being thrown upon us ever faster, day by day, then you cannot go on measure a person on past goals going forward. You need to create an environment that enables the company to swiftly react to changes and also be able to change the, the, the goals in a pipeline. Otherwise, you will have mistrust, you will have an aggressive culture, and you will have disloyal people, yeah? And, and, and that is much more costly than having an account manager who doesn't call another person, right? 
that can put your whole company in jeopardy. So those are my thoughts, but I'm not saying I'm right, right? But those are the kind of, by listening to what people say, uh, pay attention to what I read and listen to my own thoughts and, and challenging my own thoughts, which I call critical thinking, yeah? These are kind of things that goes around in my head. And I, and I don't think there's such a thing as one size fits all, no, all anymore. You have to really think about these stuff and not just say what you need to do, yeah? It doesn't work in a business going forward and it's gonna be ever more critical uh, uh, when we are all vaccinated and the new abnormal, as I call it, kicks in. There's never gonna be a new normal. That's my thoughts. Yeah, we all seen the science fiction movies and maybe now it's, sooner or later it's coming, you know. Trent, shall we have a, a final comment? Uh, yeah, so um, I just wanted to go back through that sales process that uh, you mentioned uh, kind of within our own uh, framework and make sure I didn't miss any um, of the critical steps. Uh, so I you know, lead generation, obviously. Uh, for us, I'm thinking we need uh, initial contact, um, you know, depending on how we're doing that. Uh, and then um, somebody who can do, once a meeting's been set, somebody who can do an assessment of which of our services is most appropriate. Uh, and then the next step would be have that relevant expert um, contact the person. Not sure if we're going to need closers or if our experts are going to be able to do the, uh, the closing. Uh, and then also uh, not clear on if we're going to need um, like a designated person to do upselling for that. Uh, or, or are we to use your example, gonna be using the accountants to try to upsell uh, the services. So those are like the, the kind of the six points I have there. Did I miss anything from your, uh, in, in that process? I don't think so. I don't think so. I can, I can give you another funny story. For the moment I'm working with a German Swiss dental clinic chain. So, you know, sales are in, in all areas of different sorts and kinds and shapes and forms, you know. And, um, and they have a lot of dental clients, of course, because people have to take care of their teeth. COVID, no COVID, right? And they are an essential business, so they are all open. And, uh, and uh, what is happening in, in a company like that is, is that they are all kind of sworn into the medical society and uh, somebody come and say, oh, I have a bad tooth. And then the dental clinic say, oh, well, we're going to fix that. Don't worry. Um, and then they make a filling and then they charge 120 euros and then the patient goes home. And then I ask, this is a little bit like the PricewaterhouseCoopers case. How many knows exactly what a dental clinic can do today, what they have on offer on their menu and what it costs? <laughs> so that's what this <laughs> project is all about. So now we are actually creating a nice looking clinic designed menu that people can get in their hand and sit and read in the waiting room. Uh, so they actually know what is on offer in this place, you know, because that's kind of one of the big mysteries many times when we go to a dental clinic, you know. <laughs> We've heard maybe about bleaching, but how do they do it and what does it cost? Um, what is an aligner actually? And how does that work, you know? And what does it cost? And yeah, this is interesting stuff, you know? So I think um, there's always something to do when it comes to making sure our clients know what they can buy from us. So what, one question that we're having right now is at what point do we begin upselling? That we have, you know, we have a lot of different services there. A lot of them are interlinked. But, you know, there's always the, the risk of, oh, throwing too many things at somebody all at once and then being like, oh, I, A, I, I'm not interested or because it's too much or B, wow, you guys are like, you're generalists, like you do everything. So you're not really specialists and I need a specialist type of thing. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on wh at what point to begin the upselling. I always say, ask for permission. You can actually talk to anything with any client if you ask for permission first. Example, uh, I was working with a real estate company and the salespeople in the real estate company thought it was a touchy subject to talk to the client about money. And I said, maybe you should ask for permission. And they said, what do you mean with that? <laughs> and I said, 
well, maybe you should say, is it okay if I ask you a few personal questions about what kind of money you'd like to spend on, the, on buying a property? And then suddenly they have no problems of talking about that. Or maybe somebody says, no, I don't like to, to tell you right now. I'm interested in something like this. Show me something. I don't want to give you my budget, so to speak. You know? Can I comment uh, on that? Sorry? Can I comment on that? Yes, of course. Take Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. I, I buy uh, a lot of stuff on Amazon. Not because I particularly want to. I rather buy them local. And I rather support local businesses, particularly in these times. But now and then there are stuff I buy there. Right? And I've given my consent to, uh, to uh, being informed, being notified, etc. right? And um, here the other day, I have, a, I have an old convertible with a plastic window. So I bought this plastic window, which is sipped on, right? Uh, over Amazon. I have, and I counted them, I counted them. I have in two weeks received 250 mails from Amazon about plastic rear windows for that type of an, 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 uh, a car, yeah? So being notified is counterproductive. I'm furious. I don't need all that crap, yeah? And that is what we enter into the digital age. It's like we have to be very, very focused and and really pay attention to how we deal with customers because it can easily become counterproductive. The same go with artificial intelligence. Using artificial intelligence like uh, Amazon does and many other do, yeah, is that artificial intelligence, they take past data, consolidate it and throw it to you and you're supposed to act that AI's past to make success in the future. That doesn't make sense. No. I mean, think about these things before actually uh, go in and, you know, take things on face value. Mm. That, is, that is, you know, I would urge everyone to mm. think, create ideas, consolidate those ideas, vote on them before you actually say my idea is better than yours or yours is better than mine or what have you, right? And test them, test the ideas before you go out and spend money in prototyping on, on something you don't know. Mm. No, very correct, Kato. And now Trent disappeared, but what I meant with that on his question was that if you ask the client for permission, then, then the client will tell you how the client wants to have it. You know, in his question was, when is it the right timing to start to see if they want to buy something more? Um, and maybe you should ask the client saying, listen, we have a lot of other services. Would you like to listen to it now? Or do you want us to have a new contact later in time? And then they will tell you if they want to listen now or, or later. You don't have to guess or, 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 or kind of throw the dice. You know? That's what I meant with asking for permission. You know, this, he was asking, I think, in a, in a more person-to-person uh, -person sense. I, I know, and I got that. But if you just translate that approach, you know, take that approach and then you just put it electronically. Mm. We ask them by consent, ask for their consent, mm. yeah? Mm. You do exactly the same thing. You're using all thoughts going forward in a new environment. Mm. And what I want to do is say how it can go wrong, mm. right? So, so, so there's always, you have to pay attention these days. That is my point. Yeah, no, I th and I think we, uh, as I said, my take on this question is more in kind of a uh, communication person to person level, but I, I, I think we should not be afraid of asking the right questions when, when we communicate with clients. Then if we do it in a personal conversation, if we do it over, an email or whatever it is. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's always the same. Marcus? Yeah, I think uh, it's a combination. I fully agree also with uh, the comments from Kato because, uh, yeah, uh, this new digital uh, possibilities, it's uh, also a risk that you really can uh, uh, make angry your customers because you overcrowd him with uh, trash. You know? 
but I think it's it's a combination, and I fully agree with Carter in this way because when I, I mean I was many years in the automotive industry, and the point here is there is, for example, a very nice philosophy from Toyota. This is a very inclusive philosophy. So it's uh, and the whole let's say philosophy is written down in the Toyota way, you know, and this I think combines um, your thinking, Kato, and combines obviously a robust process uh, which has been uh, uh, described by, by Peter. So um, I, th I think very good points. Huh? Congratulations, Kato. Add something here. Uh... I, I am under the impression that this, uh, your reaction, Kato, and um, is, uh, is uh, about our generation. I mean, uh, young customers uh, might uh, react differently. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, business to consumer. But you know, the young people, they expect to receive hundreds of thousands of notifications in their iPhones. They expect that, so they won't. They, they they will never be surprised if you shower them with messages, which I don't do. But you know, I think we are uh, because we have known the world before the, the digital uh, world. We have lived before, and uh, now we live in this, and we and we have adapted us. But you know, the young ones, they they have not known the world when you you ask permission to disturb someone. Excuse me, may I come to your place? I, I have a gift for you. No, you, you know, and now it's like uh, they, they have the notifications. And uh, if you see all the apps in your iPhone, you will, you, you can get notifications of everything. So you have 200 apps uh, open you get a notification all, all day. Of course, not me because I'm, I'm, I'm just like you and I, I can stand it, but I, I think it's because we have lived before. And no, the, the, the customers, they, they, they don't know that. I just they put on my jacket because I have to jump in my car to go to a meeting, but I will keep the computer on and you guys can keep on talking. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. For no, me, it's I okay. don't want to disturb the conversation, but I really need to go now. I've been pushing this a little bit now. <laughs> here, here, the organizer probably is going to be off. But yeah. Great you talk, are, guys. And, um, if you Thank want you. to have any contact with me personally, you always find me in the app, you know, Peter Redwin, you will find me there. So, Shall we have another meeting like Thank this? You. I have, okay. I, I'm scheduled to do this the last Monday every month. Okay. Yeah, okay, great. so great. let's see. You're welcome to next you have time. Meetings, <laughs> you have to invite me. <laughs> okay. Okay. You guys, I have to run, but please continue talking if you like to, okay? Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. what do you say? No, I totally agree with you, Mariana. I totally agree with you. The, 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 the point is that, uh, and even I see that on my daughter, is that when she gets the notification about the same thing or something she just acquired by the same company, she gets annoyed. And She's that's what I mean. She's your daughter. <laughs> she was educated, yeah. infused by you. <laughs> I, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. My <laughs> wife is French. <laughs> That's where. No, no. Uh, no, nah, it's, it's just, you know, you, the, I, I, I know this. Is that, uh, first of all, I have, I, have, um, I have a graphic uh, showing how the various generations consume media. Yeah? yeah. I can share it with you. Oh, and then yes. how, how the boomers are mm -hmm. using sort of broadcast television and printed news. Yeah. How Generation Set is using much more streaming online and has a much broader footprint in how they uh, acquire information. Mm -hmm. And this is where critical thinking comes in. Is yeah. that critical thinking that is about learn unlearn and relearn and and what they do what and i do this i am part on writing a book 
about digital transformation. And, and everybody thought that I read all the typical books, right, about digital and uh, accidental, as I like to call them, and McKinsey's and all of them. I didn't read any of those because they only tell me things I know from the past. And yesterday was the past, yeah? I wrote Factfulness from Hans Rosling, Sweden, yeah? And, and that is about how things has evolved in, in uh, child, infants, infants, child infant death in Africa, distributional electricity, vaccines and so on. And he had 13 questions. He went to people in UN, high professors and uh, CEOs, and also builders and plumbers and all walks of life, right? And he asked the same questions and he had three choices in answer, multiple choices. Yeah. And his argument was that if you gave chimpanzee a banana and they had to throw it in to what they thought was the correct answer, they would know but statistically, in total, they will be 33.33% right. And all these questions was asked various people in walks of life, yeah? The correctness in answers to these fact questions were under 13%. People in UN was giving the wrong answer to infant death in Africa, and they were supposed to be the expert. People didn't think that vaccination was more widely distributed today than back in the uh, 80s and 90s, the vaccines distribution. And he said, well, how can you think that when electricity is there, right? And, and so on and so forth. Very, very interesting. Those kind of books I read, and Sapiens and so on, the evolution of the human beings and, and, uh, and, um, and turned a ship around by a captain called Dick. There you go, there you go. Well done, Maria. You know, about leadership and distribution of information to, to a distribution of authority to where the information lies versus give, distributing information to where the authority is and all this kind of stuff. And then I embarked on reading those. And that's what young people do as well. They read, they take information from so many sources, not only notification, notification is a type of information. They do all of that. And then they really think about what am I going to use this information for? And then they take that information, they pick the information, they, haven't read, they don't read information to get confirmation about the idea. They read it to actually generate idea. And then their idea, when they come out with something, they share it, right? And the reason they share it is to generate clarity. Yeah, because if I write stuff, I write it down, I share it on LinkedIn, I share it on YouTube, I get feedback. That provides me clarity, right? Why am I mentioning this? Not only as a respond to Marianne, but also back to what uh, Red Rain said, yeah, about, about leads and sales and so on, right? A modern salesperson have to have to go out and do uh, critical thinking before he addresses a customer, right? And that is a fundamental change that is happening now. Yeah. I'm finished, Marcus, go ahead. No, no, Kato, <laughs> I, I, sorry, I, I sorry. hear you, I hear Marianne. I think it's an absolutely correct statement. Uh, I think the point for me, I see, and I think I have to leave then as well, but that's why I tell, I think one of the most important thing is the segmentation of customers, of the requirements, of uh, products you offer, of how to approach customers. This critical thinking you told Cutter is 
perfectly, but it's a wide array of things you have to consider. Yeah. And again, I think uh, it's, it's it's about segmentation. It's about getting all these uh, in, inputs from you and, and get it and think about your business model and how to bring it over to the different segments of clients with the right product in the right moment. This is what I would like to, how to conclude basically. And I really appreciate all these discussions and all your inputs. I think next, next month I will be back and uh, I will be happy to discuss new ideas with you. I to totally agree with you, Marcus, in what you're saying. There's absolutely no contradiction in what you're saying. But I do think we need to pay attention to when you say the needs of a customer. Yeah. And, the, and, and then when you understand that, you put the value proposition together, not exactly. just the proposition, you put the value yeah. proposition. I know you've probably heard of Alexander Osterwalder and his business model and so on. But, but what we need to be much more cognizant about, also in sales, in my opinion, is that what are the high value jobs? Even for, even for, for, for deodorants, right? You want to smell nice. That's a high value thing. There's some importance about that. There's some tangibilities behind it. There's some satisfaction or unsatisfaction behind it. And from the from the distributor, what makes it lucrative? Is it just one person who wants this deodorant, or is it the mass that wants this deodorant? Right. So if you split the high value up into importance, tangibles, unsatisfied, and lucrative, you come a long way. If you can identify all of those, yeah? And that is horizontal across person to person or, or computer to person, right? Yeah. So, so all of these things, but it's all about generating ideas in which you can move on towards something. We're taking the risk that we are adulterating the, the market again. You so, sound yeah. like an accusedness accus now. <laughs> Say that again, Marco. I, I, I was no, saying that I, I just believe that uh, you're right saying that we have to be careful on how we propose the things, especially on the digital, digital channel, because we are running, we are taking the risk that, uh, again, the, the system is going to be big mass market, even working faster when everyone is trying to sell something, but everything will look like the same. And so money for branding increase, increase, increase all the time because we are trying to differentiate product from the others because everything will look like the same and we don't want that. So, I mean, it's to try to, when I say we are saying rethink, it's not only the mechanics, but try to rethink even the mind of the people because maybe we have to re-emulate -emul the correct market and we have the chance to do it yeah. probably that, that's that that's why i said i believe that you're gonna we're gonna see business model develop for product as opposed to doing a general industry yeah. inside out uh, business model and and to generate such a business model you need and you, uh, well i believe in design design approach as opposed to a a, a scientific approach yeah so you go out, you find out what the needs are, you come up with a value proposition, you assess the feasibility and so on before you start production of, of things. And you go out and test that, right? And that is all based on ideas. Yeah. And yeah. I, but ideas isn't enough, it's execution as well. Anyway, I said enough. <laughs> Hello, sorry, I have to say goodbye. Hope to see you next month. Okay. Uh, very interesting yeah. discussions. Very uh, good inputs. Re really appreciate it. I'm grateful and I wish you uh, a good day, a good week. Take care of you and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you the same. Okay. okay Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay.